my god. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Uh, let's not do this. So welcome back, everybody. I know it's been a little bit of a hot second here since I've last actually seen you guys here. I've been really busy on my end from moving to surgeries to going on vacations. It just seems to be like the perfect time to release a season when I'm going to be absolutely busy. Targem is absolutely masterful at that, I gotta say. <laughs> but beyond that, I actually wanted to go ahead and take a look at really the meat and potatoes of these seasons. The actually main components, the Pegasus engine, the Gerardia legs, the Charybdis melee weapons, the beautiful Thesis little fancy dance pseudo scorpion weapon uh, later on. So I want to take a look at all of these, get my thoughts on them, and then uh, we'll go from there. And honestly, first things first, the Gerardia has to be absolutely probably my favorite addition to this. I was a big fan of the ML200s when they first released, but the downside about them is that they've been way too slow to actually be effective for a lot of situations. In fact, I used to use them in during convoy missions, and convoy missions were basically impossible to do. Uh, at those type of speeds just because 50 kilometers an hour if you don't think is that slow you can manage it but when it comes to actual combat the extra 10 20 kilometers an hour is absolutely huge when it comes to actually dealing with a lot of damage from being able to avoid cannon shots to get around tight turns to be able to properly focus your weapons at a distance it's absolutely crucial to have really good speed and dexterity now the actual turning radius on this or just because it's a separately large build it's not necessarily better than the ML200s. The ML200s, I feel, have a very similar turn radius, especially when you actually play around with them a bit more. So, for example, a car like this, which is considerably heavier, still actually has pretty good turn radiuses once we actually get ourselves up to speed. See, it actually feels relatively similar out here. Maybe a smidgen slower. Now, also keep in mind, too, that something like this actually has a Pegasus engine also installed, too. So the extra power on this car will help it reach acceleration and probably maintain its speed while doing turns a little bit better. But still, even with that, it's still not a huge difference. The primary difference of this thing is going to be able to quickly turn left and right or be able to get up to speed and maintain a much higher speed. So being able to avoid a lot of damage is going to be the Gerardia Special Suit here, which could easily make up for its lackluster tonnage and a little bit lackluster durability. And I'm not sure if the actual physical models themselves are lesser in themselves. Like the ML200s are fairly wide and beefy in terms of their overall like toe dimensions. But I'm not sure if that actually means they are somehow more absorbing or more likely to be hit by bullets. I'm not quite sure. But it would stand a reason that the ML200s would be a bit better at actually protecting your car from damage. Which really means that going off four-legged build with a car like this would not necessarily be as recommended. You're realistically going to need close to six just for at least a decent amount of redundancy, especially with considering the fact these are considerably less durable, so you're less likely to lose them way more frequently, especially at the higher power scores where you start encountering in excess of 10,000. So the Crypto is a bit of an interesting melee weapon because it still incentivizes you to do a rear approach absolutely as often as you can do, just for that extra little bit of surface area here, because a surface area enhancement on something like this actually does help out a lot, because when it comes to actually dealing any sort of melee damage, if you have very thin, you know, blades that you're actually dealing damage with, your chance of actually getting, like, stuck on the inside of a car is very high. That's why things like the Harvester are really good for a very long time, just because it was exceptionally easy to continuously do damage to a car, even in awkward situations, you didn't have to actually reverse out or do something like that. And the Charybdis is able to somewhat effectively negate this by at least having that little expansion blades here, because you can see they're not the absolute largest things here. So even little vans like this that have fairly wide parts in the background can actually be a somewhat of an issue here. So we go straight into the backdrop here, like an ideal build. I can see that we're already uh, failing to actually hit the car right then and there, just because the roof is slightly a bit too high. With a little bit of wiggling inside of fourth, we should be able to deal with this effectively. But you can see that with things that are like spider builds with the Gerardia builds, it can be exceptionally hard to hit things to the point where you actually may have to actually throw one of these curvaces on your roof. Or I had to make go for the old fashioned like spike hover catchers too. So while these little expansion blades do help with the big fundamental flaw with a lot of melee weapons, they don't necessarily solve it too. It just sort of lessens the impact. And it's really hard to say if the Charybdis is actually going to be that good of a melee weapon because the Harvester itself is only 400 power score, a little bit higher, but has double the durability here. One more energy requirement, and the mass is, while considerably heavier, is still not actually that bad because 
you can see that with an actual melee build that is planning on using Charybdises, you can see that we need legitimately three of them, and that matches about the width here of the average Harvester, which is not really that good. So one benefit the Charybdis does have over the Harvester, though, is that it does deal more damage while in a smaller package, which could be beneficial if you're trying to go for something like a straight-up raw cabin damage. So let's see what the damage is just on one Charybdis for a little bit of a tick. So it's about approximately 38 damage a tick here, with a tick coming over here every at least half second. I can see over here the Harvester is doing approximately 30 damage a second to the cabin. So while not an insignificant amount of damage decrease, it is also... It's super hard to recommend that because while the damage per second is still a really good metric for uh, melee weapons, a lot of the utility out of a melee weapon doesn't necessarily come out of the pack of just how fast of a raw damage can you. While it certainly is more beneficial to go ahead and chew through enemies as fast as humanly possible, being able to pin them down, uh, position in such a way that you're continuously dealing damage, or at least being able to maim them severely, is really great in terms of actually helping out your overall team. And that limited area in which the Charybdis can actually deal damage is substantially impactful. I mean, I'm not sure why the average person would go for something like three Charybdises here versus just say maybe two Harvesters in an up and down configuration. I feel like a Harvester in an up and down configuration would easily outperform something like these Charybdis all the time. Not to mention too that the Harvester itself, its perk does actually increase its damage depending on the number of negative effects and heated vehicle parts. So if you have a spark or a flame or both on a car, and you're dealing damage with a Harvester, it can easily exceed that innately of one Charybdis. So it's a bit of a mixed bag here. The Charybdis is an interesting weapon here, but still the Harvester, I feel like will definitely be a lot of people's jam, at least a lot more here, especially considering with the lower power score of this Lacerator and the Maulers here, I feel like these will still have a decent amount of space too. So the Charybdis has a small niche in which it could potentially thrive in, but... Uh, to your own opinion there for all you melee users out there. Let me know what you feel about that. Next here, we got the Kronos Light Cabin here. So if you can actually take a look at the perk here, it essentially means that passively you're going to be restoring durability to weapons mounted on its various power nodes throughout time. And the only way that you can actually recharge this repairing mechanic is that you must go harbor around near Rex for a little bit. Upon taking damage, that rate does slow down four times slower. But still, not having to actually actively manage your actual repair while in the middle of combat actually is quite nice. Now, the one thing to know about this is that does it effectively actually replace something like the Master Cabin? And I would argue that not really the case here because the Master Cabin, while it still does have a fairly substantial downside in the sense that the perk itself does require you to heat up your weapons for a little bit of time here and potentially disable the whole module for a little bit if you get damaged, it can be a bit, um, uh, it can be a bit risky. But that being said though, you can't discount that difference in tonnage, mass limit, and speed and power. Because compared to this, while it's certainly a lot faster, the absolute tonnage and mass limit on this means that your car itself is going to innately not have nearly as much armoring on it as something like the Master Cabin, which can house a considerable portion more. So the mass limit on this is 14,000, versus the Cronus is only 8,300. So that's uh, that's a huge chunk there, nearly 6,000 pounds or kilograms I should say. Now that being said, if you are generally using lighter weapons that are going for a lot more of a faster impact and quick disable, the Kronos might be beneficial. So I'm thinking more or less for things like machine guns that fire incredibly quickly or shotguns. Or on the alternative side of thing, shotguns of any category would fit quite well with this. Now another benefit though of this cabin is that it does look mighty fine. I will say so. The absolute beauty of this cabin and the speed and agility which you can use this with is quite nice. I mean, for example, a build like this it just basically looks like a nice... I, I kind of describe it as like a flying hamburger, really. It does look very smashing, I do say so. So for a lot of art builds or a lot of artisanal people, I can see this being a very nice little uh, cabin too. If you pair it with a decently sized engine that can actually add a decent amount of overall mass limit, you might be in a slightly better position and at least the lower power scores. I'm just concerned about its true effectiveness at super high power scores. Especially considering too that the actual durability recharge rate of this is only 2% every half second while you have it, and you get one charge that restores about approximately 30% durability here. While on the Master Cabin side of things, it's actually much quicker restoring 10% of its durability per second for 5 seconds. And this doesn't actually require you to hover around a wreck, so you can get around cover and actually negate a lot of the downsides of the Master Cabin. 
So a slower, more methodical build could definitely benefit a great deal more than the Master Cabin than over the Kronos. So next here we got this beautiful Thesis weapon here with this nice little incubator accessory thingamajiggy on top of it giving me some very Death Stranding vibes here. Especially considering it looks like a very meaty thing on the inside of it. I'm not quite sure what the reference is for that, but sure, great, why not? So what the perk does something for a weapon like this is that it essentially makes it so the four projectiles, instead of actually going out in a very slow methodical fashion at when you have no charges, while you actually do have charges, they all just come out in one big burst. And this is something that's automatically done for you. So if you have charges, you can't like selectively use it. You only can use it as it approaches and as you have it. So you can't just like pause that charge consumption and go back to that like machine gun firing aspect to it and you can't charge more than seven charges. So what does that actually mean? What does that actually feel like here? So we got a little cabin here, a little build that can actually test out this whole perk. So initially you start off with seven charges when you spawn into the map here. And you can see that realistically it just sounds like one big chunk. And you can see that the damage here is a pretty consistent near 300, 257 damage. Why does it change so much? I am not quite sure. I see this one's a bit more of a consistent 500. I can see with this. So let's go away from that for a hot second. And now we're into the section where we have this like chain gun firing aspect to it. I can see that it doesn't actually change the overall damage. The overall damage is still approximately 260. Same thing with this car. Even at a distance, you'll still get that 260 damage. I can see that the actual reload speed is slightly affected because it has to wait for the full volley to actually go ahead and go away before even starts to recharge. Now you can see that charges slowly accumulate. It's not like you do one charge and it gives you all seven. Each one is a slow, gradual accumulation. But let's take a look at that reloading again now that we actually have full charges. I can see that when we actually do have charges, the reloading takes place instantly after clicking. So overall, your DPS does actually go up slightly when you do have actual charges. So there is an actual incentive to go ahead and actually deal with this and actually try to get as much as humanly possible. So there's a very high innate reload speed for something like the Thursis, combined with its decent damage and its very high accuracy, as well as minimal drop-off means that this thing is going to be an absolutely fantastic sniping machine. Downside about it is that while it is fairly beefy for something like this and having a fairly high amount of penetration at 80% penetration, it is still going to be incredibly vulnerable to getting sniped off from either competing Scorpion or something like the Kaiju or other sort of very well-tracking weapons, it'll still have that huge potential to be instantly stripped off. And not being able to have multiple smaller weapons around a car that can all be individually armored and like separated so they don't get hit by like an explosion or some other effect does mean this thing is going to be exceptionally easy to strip off. I mean, Mastodon users or people who use like the very large articulating cannons, they've had this issue for a very long time, so I feel like the Thursus is going to be in that similar boat. So being able to actually protect the Thursus, especially with its super large model, is definitely going to be of incredibly high importance. So a build like this, where you just have it on this little rotating pad here, while it does look very jazzy, it is probably not going to be the ideal way to go. But we'll have to see how this actually turns out in Clan Wars. Will this actually be like something that's Clan War viable? Eh, debatably. It certainly does make building around the weapon a bit easier, though, in the sense that you can get a very nice aesthetic looking build, which is this nice little one weapon strapped on top of it. Plus, considering it only uses 11 energy, you can still actually manage to get a fair bit of other parts on your car and that can actually enhance your survivability with something like this. So if you get like a cap can and a radar and invisibility module on this car like this, it could do very well. The power score may be a smidgen high for something like the Thursis 1 here, but I think it actually is in line with other builds around this range. My goodness, I am absolutely going bonkers. There's massive amounts of construction going below my feet right now, and I can just feel it penetrating through the floor. It is obnoxious. And I really guess I can't end a video without talking about the brand new relic that was introduced into the game. And there's a bit of an issue around this in the sense that it is starting to actually use parts here that are not terribly easy to come by. Primarily, the Omamari portion of this makes it a bit of a pain in the butt to actually acquire. While the Beholder can actually be crafted in decent amounts from the Nomad side of things, the Omamari does not necessarily actually have an easily equivalent craftable portion, especially if you have not participated in previous seasons. So your actual ability to actually get a crafting recipe is severely compromised. 
So realistically, what that actually means for an end user like yourself is that this thing is going to be innately quite a bit more expensive than anything else. Now, future seasons will actually allow for crafting of things like Amawari. I believe the previous season actually did with the whole lighter situation here. But still, there is going to be quite a bit of a limited supply on things like this. You can see that already the price of these bad boys is just absurdly expensive at nearly 7,000 coins. Oh my god. And for console players, I imagine it's probably going to be 10 times worse in terms of price. So not only did they create a relic here, but this relic is most likely going to be considerably more expensive than every other relic on the market here. So the ones that I can see down here, the maximum was that firebug at 3.5. And this bad boy going for nearly 3.7. 366, so if you want to be more close, but still, my goodness, nearly a 10,000 coin difference, or a 1,000 coin difference. Ugh. So in terms of overall perk here, essentially there's almost two perks. So the first one being that it does fire three type of projectiles, the Arbor Pissing, the Incendiary, and the Explosive here in that order. And also, additionally, it has a perk that after it leaves its little shot and actually travels for a little bit, its characteristics being its actual explosion radius, damage, and impulse does increase by the set values you see below. So meaning that the longer of a shot that you actually do with the Helicon here, the actual more damage and more parts you're actually going to be taking off with this type of bad boy. And this primarily seems to be a time-based thing of how long is it in the air for, not based off purely how much distance does it travel. Now that being said, I'm not a big huge rocket user here, so I'm not quite sure as to the overall comparatively effectiveness that it is to a lot of other builds, but eh, still let's give it a try here. Let's just see what it's like on a simple little build. I can see that even on a car like this, it does a significant amount of impulse to a smaller build. The reload speed on it as well is fairly high, so you can actually go ahead and blast this thing fairly easily. The projectiles on this are very nice and straight. The actual speed of it is incredibly fast, so I feel like actually hitting your target with a rocket launcher like this is actually going to be fairly reasonable to achieve. And it looks like that a decent amount of the car is actually heated up with this rocket. And that's nearly to the 100% heat rate when you actually hit with it. So that's actually really good for actually being a somewhat of a decent assault weapon with a support component to it. So a bit of a hybrid roll weapon in a way. So now what I really want to see is what does the damage characteristics like uh, versus flight from a super long distance here. So we're going to be all the way back at this line and we're trying to go all the way down there to the in 200 range. So let's take a look at a close range car right here and just see what the damage is like. You can see that we get approximately a thousand damage there just from that little close impulse. Now what do we get at a very long distance? I am going to need to actually aim up here. And actually it was closer to 1200 at a very long distance. So I would say approximately a 20% increase in overall damage. Interesting. So the secondary perk is not necessarily going to be as beneficial as what one might think initially. It's not going to be like the whirlwind where actually hitting a super long shot dramatically decreases the damage here. It's more or less just going to be a slight bit of a perk for people who are actually firing at a distance here. And don't be confused about the ammo capacity here. The ammo capacity is not as high as what you think. It's just incredibly expanded because this person has six ammo packs on this gun. You can see that innately it only has around approximately 16 volleys. So this is a bit of an interesting weapon in the sense that because it's a bit of a hybrid in the sense it does damage and actually applies a status effect that allows for increased damage from not only you but your allies, it does actually fill a slight bit of a dual role there. It can easily slot into many team compositions. Now, being a rocket launcher is still a bit weak on the side of durability, only having approximately 384, better than something like machine guns or shotguns, but compared to those larger builds, I could see it potentially having an issue with survivability. But with this very high damage output here, it could definitely be a lot better on a glass cannon build. Maybe even like the Kronos could actually be a good fit for this, just because the extra speed on the Kronos, paired with some other type of fast moving vehicle could actually work very well or even something like the master cabin just so it can actually help enhance that durability or using something like the adverter or the MMR. and generally you won't be able to actually go for the full three of these you can only use approximately two on a build without having a little bit of energy x over 
So then you could still slap on things like reloading modules, radars, potentially a cap can, depending on how your build goes. So the weapon itself, nice. I'll never be able to play with it because I don't actually mess with any relics whatsoever because I didn't do clan wars that much. But hey, for some people out there who are a big fan of this thing, congratulations. You got a little extra toy here you can play with. For everyone else here, uh, congratulations. You got something you might get sealed club with occasionally. <laughs> But I think that's what I want to talk about here for the most part. So what do you guys actually think about these nice, lovely, lovely, beefy weapons coming out here in the Singularity Update? Are you a big fan of them? Let me know what your favorite thing you've built down below. But other than that, guys, I want to thank you all again. I'll see you guys next time. Bye. bye